cybersecurity strategist with Yokogawa Corporation. Uh, he's also leading the security subcommittee in the Open Process Automation Forum um, and is heavily involved in doing the, the security work that's going on there. So, Noah, over to you. Thank you. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the session today. We're going to be talking about what is uh, OPAPS, um, the Open Group Automation Standard. Um, as an, why is it an opportunity to uh, advance our security for industrial control systems? Um, so a little quick uh, go over my bio. So I, I've been, uh, Jim has mentioned, uh, not only member or co-chair of the security subcommittee for OPAPS, but also member of ISA and IC and board member of ISA Secure and ICEE uh, CMC the organization managing the certification uh, against uh, for industrial uh, automation and control system security. Um, and in addition, my perspective, as you will see, I uh, come from a career in uh, uh, industrial operations. So I come from the perspective doing uh, work in the field and understanding how the technology will make my business better and the overall business I work for better. So let's get some context. Um, so the first thing is there's no doubt this uh, so-called operational technology environment that in which we live today is in transformation. So we're, we are uh, in a place uh, where uh, we call it operational technology because we are living in a place where we have these really large assets, physical assets, doing some important process that uh, transform elements, physical elements, into other elements. And, and then we have this physical plant. That physical plant, and uh, doing this transformation, is becoming more digital. But it doesn't mean that becoming more digital is going to become digital. The physical aspect will always be, will be there. We rely on uh, the digital to improve the operation of the physical aspect. So not only that, uh, in addition to the evolution of uh, the asset, uh, we have evolution in the systems and the hardware and the software we use. We call the automation software and hardware. So if you can, you will see that throughout our physical uh, uh, installations, plants, as we call, uh, we are implementing hardware advancements. So we have more robotics and things that will replace uh, humans, or better, not will we replace humans, will take humans out of unsafe places in which they have to be today because of the nature of the process, physical process they are dealing with. So uh, it has a process, our physical hardware automation has a process to help us in that aspect. And software, of course, is the element that also is advancing. We have better ways to do control. We call it advanced control, integration with uh, uh, the business uh, systems, uh, manufacturing exchange, uh, uh, and some other uh, high-level information that are required to speed up our business. And, uh, and that, in turn, is creating a high demand for the information that is being collected at the physical level to give them more business meaning. Another element that is impacting, of course, uh, the, this transformation is this set of uh, global uh, manufacturing initiatives. You probably have heard of many of them. The very, well, I guess, uh, most well known is uh, Industry 4.0. You can hear it everywhere. But China has a, an equivalent manufacturing initiative. Korea has an, an equivalent. Japan has Society 5.0, another manufacturing initiative. The US is looking, is trying working uh, mm, with uh, the Industrial Internet Consortium for this new um, manufacturing initiative. These are initiatives that are thinking, what if we move to the IIoT world? So this is a transformation between from OT to IIoT happening. And then you see organizations like us, uh, the Open Group and the Open um, Process Automation Forum in particular, that are working into uh, uh, transform some of the ways uh, process is managed in, in a plant today. And there are initiatives pushed by other groups like the Namur and, uh, and, and uh, Europe. Some of you are might, may, might be very well 
uh, acquainted with Namor. And of course, we are looking with organizations like the OPC uh, Foundation, which are trying to say for a world like this one that is so diverse, yes, we need a way to interoperate. They are coming into the way to say how we can interoperate in this diverse world. So if my environment is changing, cybersecurity for this environment is also changing. So cybersecurity is a product of the context. And industrial cybersecurity is for the context of our business. So there's no doubt that in our business there is more uh, today. We are getting into a, even, even more integration between what we call the OT and IT uh, world, which uh, that integration is, is uh, beneficial for both ends. The business side is getting to understand better what uh, is done on the operational side and the operational side being able to understand what is not better but interface better with uh, leverage technologies that were meant to be used originally on the IT side. There is uh, another element of change, of course, I mentioned to you is IIoT and uh, the open process, uh, process automation. So OPA is not the only open process initiative. You can see that many others, that open PLC and many more happening. So open is there, it has to do with IoT and the ability to work and interoperate with multiple vendors. So what is the meaning? We are in an era, era of disruption, of course, innovation, but more importantly is time for new value propositions. So that's uh, important to have. Another element in this context of cybersecurity is um, the application, the traditional way and the future way. So we just heard this interesting presentation from Bob about how um, uh, security uh, is necessary to apply in uh, uh, the vehicle uh, manufacturing in vehicles, in human sciences, medical systems, and the importance of applying uh, consistency standards, a risk management process. It's interesting that I was watching you showing the, the risk bow tie matrix, the risk bow tie behind there from uh, the elements that uh, become the threat to the business impact and how you manage those through a process. This is, that's an ingrained process we have in operational technology and we have been living for years because it's tied to safety. And it, it's the way, actually it's called process safety, started to push that into place because of physical accidents, not virtual accidents. Physical accident, accidents that have tremendous impact into the environment and uh, human life. So, uh, industrial cybersecurity uh, has uh, traditionally been working with these very large assets, uh, facilities, complex industrial facilities, managing complex process, transforming physical raw materials into other materials that we use in our daily lives. Right? So uh, it, it has been traditionally uh, implemented, cybersecurity has been applied traditionally for to these industries, we call the process industries, the chemical, uh, the nuclear, uh, the pipelines, manufacturing, of course, uh, what we call critical manufacturing, in fact, not necessarily every kind of manufacturing, and the energy sector, uh, you know, power generation and um, um, power distribution are highly managed through process uh, automation and control systems. Um, so, but we've seen it's a trend. There is a there is an extension of, of, of the operational technology into, into other areas, I, such as mining. Transportation is definitely there. Uh, I was last week in Australia and uh, attending meetings, and those two are very close to them in heart, mining and transportation. And then, of course, we have building automation, moving into the elements of controlling our physical buildings and so on. Uh, even more, it's moving into the medical system, as uh, Bob also mentioned. So uh, cybersecurity or industrial transformation uh, is now touching new, area, new uh, areas, and, um, and that's important to, uh, to know. What is also changing? We, uh, to secure this type of physical asset, uh, of course, uh, and to operate in this type of complex physical asset, we require the standardization. Standardization gives us assurance that things are applied consistently, and give us some other elements of quality, but safety assurance in the way. Security is not different, and security for the space also requires standardization. And uh, we have 
created over these many years uh, since uh, uh, operational technology of cybersecurity appeared, an architecture based on functional, functional layers and the functional layers that happen in the industrial environment. So we have that architecture that you probably have seen in, uh, in the past in some places. But what's happening is with this uh, transformation of the business, some of these boundaries are getting blurry, are changing, are not ne necessarily the same ones. So what we, we mm, used to call level uh, one and two systems or zero, or are there could be a mix of these systems. The important thing is that uh, the perimeter of the plant is not anymore physical. So this is a perimeter which is becoming a virtual. It's not only virtually located at the plant or the corporation man managing the assets. It could be virtually located out on the internet. And, uh, and we're not saying that the plant is an internet of things. Uh, the sensor could be of an internet of things. The plant cannot. Uh, but um, so the plant is moving from this physical asset into a, a virtual plant. And I might need to operate, as I showed you on that first, first slide, uh, a digital twin to help me see in digital terms what is happening in the physical world, and even more, being able to control what is happening in that world. So what is the trend here? The trend is not uh, just moving anymore into networks or enterprise systems and uh, computers and, you know, it's actually moving to the inner element, the closest, the simplest element. In our case, we call it components, and within the components, what? Applications. And this brings me close to what we're doing in uh, OPAS. You will see that what we're doing in OPAS is related very close to this last point. There is an, an ox, a next element of discussion. I mentioned to you that we use security, uh, we, we use levels functional levels to describe the uh, functionality of the systems and processes we manage in a plant, but also to manage the security throughout those. So part of the conversation is whether or not the efforts we have made today, until today, have concentrated pretty much on, on the upper levels, four, three, and two, not necessarily looking into level one and zero. And there's also a discussion in within this our industry uh, 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 circles that is it uh, that, lev that level zero, the instruments? And the thing is that instruments are of different classes, right? We have uh, digital analog instruments, but they are becoming more uh, smart, intelligent. We are attaching those, those instruments to uh, small computers and giving running application into, into them, making them smart. The issue is this one. Uh, contrary to any other asset that you, you use in the world, uh, a car or a vehicle, a plant is something that is designed to be there running for many, many years, managing this physical process to make it profitable for whoever is investing in this business. So there are elements that we call the brownfield, me meaning what is uh, in place, the current, and the greenfield, the new. So the challenge for cybersecurity is you always have to deal with there's an something that is installed and how do you deal with the install base and how do you deal with the new. So we have to have uh, a way to adapt and to um, provide security for both at the same time. So let's look into uh, some uh, 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 into the evolution and trends into this OT cybersecurity space. Um, at first, this is, a, uh, uh, this is a slide I put together to try to push two things. So we have uh, a line representing the evolution of the threat over the years. And a line, a blue line, identifying the evolution of the defense. I like to see these as two pushing forces. The attack is pushing to raise their threat, and the defense is pushing to, ra to raise their defense. The idea is to be able to close that gap between the two, and hopefully, at some point, even surpass where the gap is the opposite, is negative. The threat goes on to the negative, not on the positive. 
Well, that is uh, ambition. How, how are we doing this? So the, the threat uh, for OT actually, as many of you studied, is simply casual. So we were just casualties of uh, something that was happening in the IT environment. The IT environment, and, and yes, many people were saying, oh, no, that is not true because the operational technology environment is fully erg up and totally disconnected. Well, we, we, was, we were shown at the beginning of the years when uh, we started uh, being vi victims, casual victims of uh, IT threat, and then our systems were disrupted. Well, this is interesting because if you read the news of ransomware and how much they affected factories, at, I don't give names, but in the car making industries, in uh, major ports, and so on, right? It should be the and they were affected by something called ransomware. And the systems that were affected were the industrial systems, actually forcing them to shut down operation. So even 18 years later, 51, since we, we started to be victims of IT, we still are. So that means that we have to do something better, right? In terms to push that defense up and well, the attackers are, are changing. So that was the first phase of attacks. The second phase or group I call the second generation is a group of uh, attacks based on PTAs. And actually there are two sources of PTAs, those who are digging for uh, intellectual property and in, in all cases there are uh, state sponsors and some others trying to create disruption or even monitoring. Um, so that's the case of uh, the, the uh, threats or PTAs that were threatening pipeline industries in, in the States and uh, the UK and some parts of Europe during that era. And then more, late, more lately, we have this third generation and I call the targeted. They are now OT targeted actually. This is a set of threats that are becoming more and more savvy. And, uh, and but as I mentioned to you, we still are victims of ransom, uh, uh, ransomware. So how does how is that possible? On the defense side, how we do push our posture up? Of course, we work in technologies over the year. We create perimeters. We import technologies from the IT side that probably work well in that environment. But we have learned over the years is that not all of them are effective and can be effectively applied in OT. So they are the, uh, the realities of uh, applying um, technologies in the OT space. So a good example is patching. We are all used to patching in our cell phones today, right? We receive uh, an alert from Apple or Google saying there's a patch available. Click here to download it, install it, and yeah, we wait five minutes, reboot, and we will we leave happy. Well, in the OT world, if I have a, a critical system that is monitored by other mission critical, uh, excuse me, a critical process that is mo monitored by mission critical systems. And if I go to have to have to reboot that system, I might will break the integrity of the entire process. So it's not an easy control to apply. It's not that it's about control. Operationalizing that control has its own uh, elements. And, and there are things you need to know because it's not applying the control like you apply to your consumer device or you apply it to uh, any normal IT system. So there's another thing. What is, what is the trend uh, of the threat? As I mentioned to you, the threat started to be just simply uh, disruptive. And it was casual disruption. It was not targeted of, of, of any effort. In the middle of that process, the, the intention changed from which was casual disruption to destruction. So we have the exam example of Shamoon in uh, Saudi uh, Arabia and some others. Hey, in destroyer in Ukraine. Well, actually, the uh, in the case of uh, in destroyer in U Ukraine, people are also saying that it meant that meant to be destructive, right? Be able to break down the entire power system in, in that country. So the, the intention has changed. I mentioned to you before that the target is also changing. It's going from this uh, uh, broader target to really specific. So we have examples. 
and then the skills the attackers, of course, are using used to be generic IT, but to perform the most recent attacks that have affected our power industry, our uh, oil and gas industries, and manufacturing, critical manufacturing industries, and many others, uh, what the, the attackers are showing are OT skills. They are OT savvy. They, sa they know about the technologies, processes, applications, protocols, and so on. And this is a, a really important realization. The attacker is not after my auto automation system. My at the attacker is not after that little computer. It, that is just simple the means. Because the attacker is after the big, the big goal of the attacker is that physical aspect and the impact that he, he or she can have on that physical aspect. Or the impact that that physical asset can have in a, can have in a greater greater ecosystem. So how we have uh, managed the response over the years? So we apply a simple process that been applied for years consistently related to risk management. Starts with assessing the risk, right? Developing and implementing countermeasures and maintaining those countermeasures. Doing auditing to ensure that the controls are physically and constantly maintain. Those are people, process, and technology uh, control. What we have learned in this process and over the years is that um, those that life cycle is a lot, of, uh, a lot more complex than it is today. So it requires uh, the uh, different uh, stakeholders, what we call the supply chain. So this uh, uh, life cycle that was created originally and meant to be used by the what we call the asset owners in some places, the end users, uh, right? The asset, uh, the asset owners. Um, there are processes that need to be applied equally by those organizations doing uh, or providing services to the asset, or integrating new system. In the case of new system, or or providing products, supplying the products, and the, the they are all important into this life cycle. So, because we work in a industry that has all these elements of risk, it, it likes to be structured and is highly standardized. It makes sense and it helps uh, all the players to work and in interoperate safely and give assurance to the asset owners and business owners that plants and the different elements are managed consistently throughout. So the industry at, at large has been working since uh, 2007 in what we call the uh, started to be ISA 99 and now IC, well for many years, IC 6443 standard. So this is a standard and again it's part of our response. Our response to be tends to be push. We tend to respond to this threat through uh, standards. But is a standard sufficient? And the question here, it is not. It depends on the maturity of the organization and how you apply this if you want recommendations, in some cases requirements, depending on who is applying those, and you consistently apply those controls into the organization, and uh, and you keep them up to give you the, the uh, security assurance that you're looking for. So uh, 62443 is a complex standard series. It's, uh, it's made of uh, uh, several parts, and the, the first parts were meant, as I mentioned to you, for the asset owner. You can read the numbers there. There, there was a, no, a new uh, an, a, a next set of uh, uh, parts or specifications built for the system integrators, for the system providers. And uh, this is showing what I showed you before, the tendency that we're moving into uh, the simplest element. So in the case of the standards, we're also going down to the product. So we want now to be sure that our products not only embed uh, security uh, functionality or security features for uh, within the IT world, right? But security functionality, but not only that, that security functionality is developed and implemented under a secure development life cycle. And so, and th this is not new. If you come from the IT world and uh, you see that we are converging, this is actually the convergence of, of those two concepts. Um, moreover, as I mentioned to you, the way to ensure our um, uh, safety is through certification. So we prove that somebody claiming, making claims that you have a, a, an explosion-proof system, it is explosion-proof system. 
because if you don't not only get that claim but test that claim, if something happened, you would end destroying a physical asset, right? So certification testing is really important for this environment, and uh, as such, there are organizations building, as, as you know, ISA, IC got together to build IC three, IC six two four four three now, and but each one have uh, their own organizations for testing. In the case of ISA, it's called ISKI, and uh, with or ISA secure, and uh, in the case of IC, IPE, it's traditional uh, the conformity assessment organization. In terms of security certifications, uh, ISA secure has been working in uh, doing. Um, certification for security certification for systems and actually products embedded devices for a long time they call it the EDSA so EDSA actually if you notice in this slide has been in, in place since 2010 was it aligned to 4-2 to, uh, 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 the most recently released standard for uh, um, suppliers uh, no but actually was instrumental in that journey of developing the standard and uh, actually it's fully aligned, being from the same organization. It's fully aligned with the new version, of course, no, not the oldest version. Uh, and it, you can see there's also an old uh, certification called SDL. So for many years, I said Secure as well has been tracking the secure development of applications in this space. So, uh, and embedding security into products, excuse me, and, and products for our, our components and applications. So SDLA has been in place and is fully aligned uh, with uh, also recently released 4-1 standard. Of course, there's a, an old, uh, our pre-existing certification for systems and, and so on. I see, understanding that th this is complex and of course, um, there, there's a, an element I don't have in these slides and it's the element of regulatory compliance. If any of you are coming from the European Union, you probably have heard of the NIST directive and ha how much it has been settled and now 62443 or better, cybersecurity standards and certifications is now a requirement. How is it going to be applied? It's going to be applied on a per uh, uh, con m member country, right? Legislations, uh, so they're just setting a, a framework. But it's there and, and as such, ICE is catering to, to that. Now ICE, ICEE um, is uh, fully uh, uh, cognizant better that uh, the standards are moving to other industries, not just the heavy industries that, that I mentioned to you of physical assets, but moving into the medical and transportation, building automation and so on. And that, that uh, by moving into those, the standard, all the sections of the standard might, might not be applicable. So they, they need to be open to the creation of profile. Well, uh, guess what? OPA is also one of those examples. So we are building some um, um, functionality for a specific concepts. It's not going to resolve the hunger, the, 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 the will hunger, and you will see in a minute what it was going to resolve. So um, you probably have heard of uh, NIST. Uh, you can have probably have heard of NIST 882. You probably have heard of NERCSIP, and yeah, those actually, uh, NIST is a framework that applies to US government agencies, actually it's regulatory compliance, mandatory for them. Uh, 882 is a guideline for implementing in control for industrial automation and control system. Fully aligned with 62443, by the way, with references to 62443, by the way, excuse me. And then you have NERC. NERC was created in the United States for the protection of electrical systems and as a result of uh, some, uh, uh, some incidents. And uh, in, in order to raise the bar in the power sector in the United States, and they created a, a their own standard. That standard is not aligned to 62443, it's completely different. Um, and it has some, con some controls. Yes, it can be mapped. And uh, uh, yeah, that's all that I have to say. Power, uh, the power, um, the international power industry in, in general, when they started to hear about NERC, they got uh, also thinking, we are gonna get regulated everywhere in the world. And for that we got, we have to be prepared. So they started to uh, work on that standard series under IC 
called the 62351. Uh, and uh, it's a standard series that in which they realized that uh, the weakest point in um, power management systems was actually the protocols, the communication protocols they use and uh, information models they use to, to keep the systems up. So what uh, they're often after in this standard series is securing, actually going from just not the what, but how, specifically how to secure each one of these protocols. And then we have uh, uh, other standards and frameworks we need to build. Of course, we have IEC, IEC Industrial Internet Consortium. They came out with a framework. They come out with this perspective that all the things that, uh, that uh, uh, are traditionally done on, on the OT side could be missing some elements that are important and uh, are being been doing on the uh, on the IT side. Actually, uh, both are required if we want to coexist in an industrial uh, Internet of Things tomorrow. So those are important references, and I can give you more. And this and this is a new standard from the medical sector um, that is now aligning. Uh, and by the way, IIC is also working with uh, IS899. I see T65 working with PEN jointly participating in the efforts for making 62443 and more uh, globally encompassing industry standard. So it's not about standards, as I mentioned. It's also implementing and maintaining. So what is the op opportunity? How many of you were in uh, Brad's presentation yesterday? Please raise your hand. So not many of you. Well, what is open? So this is an, an, an industry standard that we need to, the, uh, the open group is working on. And it's re related to open process automation. It has a, a particular context, and uh, that's what I want to bring here. This is not about uh, creating an IoT device. This is about moving uh, uh, the um, computing uh, uh, power to the edge. So traditionally, the, the computing in the uh, process control industries has been centralized. Uh, and actually, as you, you probably heard yesterday, we call those uh, wrongly distributed control systems because it's actually centralized in one place. So what OPAS is uh, doing is trying to break out that and say, I need to move the computing closer to where I'm capturing my signal. And in our world, we call that I.O. So actually, is this part on the left? We have I.O. And I.O. Can, can be also coming wireless. So everything on the south is digital world. And OPA is not ch planning to change that. It's planning to interface with that because the um, uh, main users of this group have a specific requirement that this is about process automation and for uh, uh, for industries like, like uh, oil and gas, power, or many others that will require large systems. So the idea is that uh, we are creating um, a new set of components. We call it the DCN. It's a component with uh, some computing power and uh, where the idea is that we will be able to run applications. And what is new here is that in the past, uh, you could only run applications on the component from some particular vendor. The idea here is that the applications can, you can buy your hardware from any one of the vendors and run your applications on any one of the hardwares uh, or the hardware platforms. But to do that, there are many elements that need to have into play because that functionality was, uh, the control functionality was before provided within machi one machine, we need to create different things. So we need a connectivity framework, a way to ensure that these uh, systems or components, and now in an OPAS environment, the, the expectation and the ambition is that there will be thousands of this that will, get, will be getting closer and closer to the I.O. So they are going to be managing subsets of the I.O. New devices are going to be coming with the capability to interface directly with the new I.O. But I mentioned to you that this world of OT has to deal with what? Brownfield and Greenfield. So this part on the right is illustrating to you that we need to deal also with the legacy. 
and in providing interfaces to the legacy because otherwise you won't be able to sustain and maintain your assets. So to give you an example, an, uh, a refinery plant with thousands of uh, IO points with miles of miles of wire, uh, if we intend to change that one, it's going to cost probably more than what the uh, refinery cost at the beginning. So that's impossible. You have to live with what is existing. And actually, those sensors that we have in place, many of them have been, well, as I mentioned to you, they have to go through extensive safety testing and be able to operate uh, under harsh conditions for many years are there. Do I need to replace them? No, they're working. And they're, the signal that I'm receiving is of high quality, and I still need the, the signal. Do I need to replace all of them? No. I'm going to replace those that make sense. So the ambition here is to replace the computing power and to distribute that computing, uh, computing power. So what is the difference? Of course, that OPAP is bringing. The difference is that in the past, and traditionally, even for IT systems, uh, security needs to be an afterthought. And it's some, something we bolt on after. And we struggle. So we put firewalls and gateways and you name whatever is the way we call the shield, we put shields around. But the element is not secure intrinsically. And the, the idea here is how to make it uh, uh, intrinsically secure, if you like. We, some people don't like the word, of course, it's very close to safety. But what we have chose is to use the word secure by design. So that's the main difference. OPAP is building uh, from the get-go uh, components that are secure by design. Secure by design mean, uh, means that we need to incorporate security in all, all aspects of the architecture. And notice that our architecture is, uh, of that component is complex because that architecture that rely on a set of management systems on the top to keep the integrity of the, uh, of the control architecture, such as configuration management, application management, and uh, system management. But also, we need security management systems to support this operation. And to give you an example, certificate management services and so on. Those are services that uh, you need to support a component that is secure by design. I could have the capability to, pro uh, to provide and manage certificates within my product. But if there's no way to control how I exchange the, those certificates with the other nodes, that environment is not going to work. So we have worked into creating the interfaces and embedding um, security in all aspects of the architecture. And you can see the application works, it goes all the way from the applications running within the, the, the component to the way the applications communicate within the component and outside of the component, independently of the hardware that is called the distributed control framework or uh, connectivity framework, it's part of it, as you can see. And of course, you need to have a distributed control um, um, platform, which are the DCP that is related on how you are going to interface with your physical hardware platform, that it could vary from vendor to vendor. So you need to have a way to standardize. We're working on all these aspects to make it happen. Notice that the I.O. is out of scope. We are not changing I.O. We need to interface with I.O., whatever is the current format. And there are, by the way, hundreds of ways, uh, buses, uh, digital buses, analog buses that exist today that we might need to interface with. So secure by design. What is secure by design? So one of the main uh, concerns of OPA uh, stakeholders, of course, is that, yes, we need the functionality. But it's very important that in order to ensure that security functionality is embedded into the products, that is done through a process where security is consistently applied from, um, or uh, integrated better, right from the beginning, from the uh, design, the development, and the implementation, so that you can have so what we call a product with security functionality. That is good. But a product with security functionality that cannot be maintained and supported is not good. So actually, uh, the standards and OPA are looking for uh, that second part of the Secure development life cycle, the one that give us the ability ma to manage defects, update, and manage the, the product through the end of life. 
So it's going to give us assurance that security is managed through the end of life of that product. And that requires some behaviors and, some dis dis uh, and so on described. But it's the end goal, of course, is to be able to have a sup supported product with integrated security functionality. So we have an instrument to that can help us to do that. And as you know, OPAS is not to reinvent the wheel. It's supposed to be a, a standard of a standard, so it's a reference standard. Similar, how many of you are working in architecture for the open group? Okay. So for all, for all of you, that's very close because we open, we, we call op reference architectures. This is saying similar concept. Instead of using a reference architecture, we use reference standards. And then, um, of course, we need to work in a, a variety of areas, of security areas, that uh, implement controls within the end component. Be, being that component, uh, the hardware piece, so, well, hardware software piece of com component called DCN, or the application itself. So for all our components, we, we are worried about a, a way to identify, first of all, the resource integrity. So how the, the component boots in, in a, in a uh, secure mode, all the way to how is that component going to be identified when it's joining uh, an OT, uh, uh, an OPAS network? How do I know that is, uh, what is that thing that is uh, being connected to my network? And now, uh, is that something that I can trust? And if, if it's trusted, I need to authenticate uh, not only the component, maybe the users of that component. I also need to authorize that component to participate and be a member of my ecosystem, but I also need to authorize the users in that, uh, of that system. And I need to uh, provide uh, resource availability. That has with oper operational reliability is being sure that the resource, I have to wait for monitors for ways to ensure that my resource are, is always available. Okay. So I cover the integrity pa part steps. I need to cover the availability aspect, which are dear to the OT space. And of course, there's no environment and no good security if I don't know what I have and I, I cannot recover it quickly. So for that, I need uh, configuration management, resource configuration. I should be able to quickly know what was the last configuration at or state of my component and be able to restore to that configuration and a state if there's a failure. And all that, of course, is being provided through communication integrity, uh, confidentiality and availability, data integrity, confidentiality and availability, restricted authorized access is still is going to, uh, to be uh, uh, a core concept in OT, being able to create a zones and even independently of, of the environment in which you are, and of, of course being able to trace back uh, to accountability, audit auditability, and so on. And finally, being able to integrate uh, operational and security monitoring. So all those things can be provided through the application of IC 6443. So with all this realization, we said, well, we have a great opportunity. And what is our life cycle? What is the life cycle of OPAS? Um, so the, the first uh, um, generation of OPAS, the intention is to be able to uh, define or de define or design, build, and um, and maintain products. And so we need to create a security framework of what are those things that are that uh, would uh, or the standard that that will give us se uh, security assurance. And as you can see. We have identified a 4-1, 4-2, and 3-3. 3-3 is applicable for subsystems. Now, this is probably, for if you come from the IT side, it's hard to understand the concept, but um, in the OT world, not all systems are the same. Very, actually, very, very few systems are static, meaning they are meant to do uh, to address a specific implementation. So unless I'm managing the same cracker and with the same condi physical conditions, I might be able to put uh, equal systems in two plants. In my, many cases, not. They might have the, the same physical components, if you want, a computer, a uh, network mm, switch, and mm, few other sensors, uh, sub-controllers that are, b are part of my system, that they are not static. We and when we can do that, and to a good extent, we call that one uh, the uh, 
desktop system. And, and, and that's what we are going to cover with 3.3. So notice that the standard is also, from our evaluation, good for many perspectives because it's also helping us with other areas in the life cycle that are not in the scope today. So when the asset owners or end users, as we call it in OPA, uh, start to be uh, concerned about how these components, and it's actually the approach that Bob mentioned, you need to go with the end components and move the trustworthiness up, then the, the system integrators need to kn know that they are building with si products that are trustworthy, they can integrate. There are other standards that will help them in that process, and some the other parts of the standard that will applicable to the end user and service provider once you get into operation. So uh, overall, we see a, a good fit and map. Um, another thing we have done is, of course, um, this release, uh, next release of OPA, is uh, uh, meant to, um, the main objective is about interoperability. So as such, we are not covering all aspects of uh, what we intended to do. There are elements such as portability, hardware portability, application portability, and so on. Other elements that will be integrated in OPA as, as, as the specification progress. But being a standard of standards, uh, the connectivity path is being provided for release one by a standard name of called OPC UA. Many of you are aware of it. And uh, um, some of the system management related to manage the, the, the management of the hardware are provided through a piece of another standard called Redfish. Actually, Redfish comes from the IT side. Or IT side. Uh, OPC UA comes from the OT side. And uh, none of them, of course, had references interesting to 16443. I mentioned to you that uh, NIST and others have, even IIC, uh, they have references on the importance to uh, the controls in 16443. Well, these two did not. So part of our work here was to ensure, well, to go over the functionality, security functionality that these standards provide, the security functionality that we, we have chosen to implement as part of this release, and being sure that it can be, um, that it ties and maps to the security controls managed and defined by 16443. So this is uh, a part of the work we have done. And to finish, what is uh, the, en the end goal? And the end goal here, of course, um, we started with uh, a gap. And the intention here is by doing secure by design in our products, we will be able to push or to narrow that, that gap that we have today. So with that, thank you very much for your attention.